Welcome everyone to the webinar, Promoting Urban and Community Forestry Through Staffing, Volunteer Groups, Tree Boards, and Ordinances. My name is Holly Campbell and I'll be the host for the webinar today. I'm an Extension Associate with Southern Regional Extension Forestry, working in urban forestry and wildland fire education and outreach. As part of the Cooperative Extension System, our office develops educational products and resources to support forestry and natural resource programs across the southeastern U.S. region, like this webinar today. Our website, our website is sref.info if you'd like to learn more about what we do, and that uh, URL is in the top right, top right corner of the slide. Our presenter today is Dr. Richard Hauer from the University, I'm sorry, <laughs> that was our last webinar speaker. <laughs> our presenter today is Dr. Brian Walliniak, and um, Brian is going to correctly pronounce his last name for me when he gets started, um, but he is from the uh, Penn State University Extension. And so before formally introducing Dr. Walliniak, I will provide a short introduction. So I'd like to thank the University of Georgia Cooperative Ext Extension for co-hosting our Zoom webinar today. Today's webinar is part of a larger series entitled Understanding Urban and Community Forests and Extension Webinar Series. This series was planned by Southern Regional Extension Forestry with input from several cooperative extension urban and community forestry experts in the Southern region. This slide includes the planning partners for the series and their input on key topics and speakers was essential in putting this series together. The series is designed for educators, specifically Cooperative Extension County educators. However, each webinar in the series is also relevant to natural resource managers, other educators, arborists, urban foresters, and more. So regardless of your work focus, all are welcome to join today's webinar and any webinars in the series. The goal of this series, which includes 12 webinars in all, is two part. One, to increase extension educators' knowledge of research-based urban and community forestry information. And two, to provide educational resources that support delivery of that information to the public. So ultimately, the series aims to increase extension's role in urban and community forestry education and outreach. We're hoping the series will reach not only extension personnel focused on horticulture, urban forestry, and natural resources, but also extension involved in family and consumer sciences and other focus areas where appropriate. So this slide includes some of the other webinars in the series. If you'd like to see ones not listed on this slide, you can go to sref.info and follow um, the links there to see the whole series list. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Cooperative Extension, um, I wanted to provide a little bit of a background. The Smith-Lever Act formalized extension in 1914, establishing the U.S. Department of Agriculture's partnership with land-grant universities to apply research and provide non-formal agricultural education. Congress created the extension system to address rural agricultural issues. Today, however, extension has expanded its focus to match changes in society and economics, providing research-based education in areas like family and consumer sciences, forestry and natural resources, youth education, and much more. Popular extension programs include many that you've probably heard of, like 4-H and the Master Gardener program. So extension is a trusted information resource in communities. And for those of you who are not part of extension, we make great partners to help disseminate information to the public. So keep us in mind um, as a potential partner on your next urban and community forestry project. Though several extension educators provide urban and community forestry information to their communities, the amount of educators in extension in this area are few. So our hope is that these webinars help increase extension educators' role in urban and community forestry education and outreach. There are likely participants listening to this webinar who are unfamiliar with a few of the many benefits of urban trees and forests. So I wanted to cover some of those in this slide. So again, just a few. Uh, urban trees and forests help clean our water and our air. They reduce hot summer temperatures, reduce wind speed and noise. They've been shown to reduce crime and provide a sense of place and connection, beauty and food. They also reduce our energy bills and increase our property value. And as Dr. Walliniak will share momentary, momentarily, trees continue providing these benefits in part when local governments and communities act to support their care and management. 
So I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Brian Walliniak. Dr. Dr. Walliniak is an urban and community forestry educator with Penn State Extension, working in southwestern Pennsylvania, Allegheny County in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, he is also an ISA certified arborist. Okay, Brian, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. And uh, good job with my name. I think you got that pretty close. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and I, I accept uh, many different pronunciations. So. Oh. So, that works. so I should switch over to my presentation now. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Holly, for uh, having me uh, today to present. Uh, certainly appreciate this whole series. And uh, as Holly has kind of just introduced, uh, giving us a little bit of background on extension as well as um, some of the benefits of urban and community forestry that's really going to uh, play into why uh, we want to uh, promote uh, this and, and work within our municipalities and in our communities to uh, make uh, community forestry happen. So today, I'm going to talk on this topic about uh, how we can really uh, not just promote but establish and uh, um, have a successful urban and community forestry program uh, in our community. And this really is about people mainly. So we're talking about staffing, volunteer groups, tree boards, but we'll also talk about the ordinances that allow this to be uh, put into place in a, a more formal way within your community. Um, as uh, Holly mentioned, I do work in the uh, Pittsburgh area up in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so I'm happy to be able to follow a few weeks prior, my uh, colleague, uh, Vinny Catrone, presented on a lot of the things that we are doing here in Pennsylvania. Uh, so if you haven't watched his presentation, I would certainly encourage you to go back and check uh, that out as well to see some of the uh, programs we're working on here in Pennsylvania. Okay, so in this presentation today, I'm going to talk about primarily starting with tree boards and commissions, what they are, and talking about how they get established, how they work, and we'll talk a little bit about municipal staff uh, within that, where they fit in. Uh, we'll also talk about ordinances that really allow that tree board to be established um, and allow for various uh, protections for trees, uh, various other uh, codes and laws that allow us to really expand that urban forest. But we'll also talk about volunteers, public participation, how we get the community involved. Uh, we really need the community on board to have a successful program. And then I'll talk about what that role of extension is in helping all of this move along. So we'll start with kind of what we typically run into is some of the issues we see. Uh, within a community, within a municipality. We often see kind of poor administration, poor decision making, uh, poor uh, design and analysis of sites, you know, specifically around tree planting, poor maintenance of our trees. Uh, this often is really coming from a lack of commitment from uh, leaders in the community as well as uh, lack of awareness on the part of uh, citizens in the community. And so it also ends up being a low funding priority and a low priority overall. And so very quickly, our community forests can really uh, fall apart without a lot of commitment to it. So how do we make this, how do we get past these problems and make a good program and, and make it work? So those steps, kind of pieces to this puzzle would be uh, having a shade tree commission or a tree board, um, having some ordinances on the books that help uh, protect trees, and then getting the community involved. So we'll start with talking about tree boards, shade tree commissions. I'm going to preface kind of everything I talk about in this presentation is really based on um, Pennsylvania laws. So you may have variation from state to state, uh, place to place about 
uh, what what works or doesn't work in your particular location. Uh, in fact, I saw in the uh, chat pod just starting up this presentation, I think we have some uh, folks from outside the country even. So uh, that's going to potentially be a completely different uh, uh, can of worms in terms of how that would function in your location. Uh, so the title that we had in, um, for this presentation used the word tree board. In Pennsylvania, we refer to these as shade tree commissions. Uh, so if I say tree board or shade tree commission, tree commission, I mean the same thing. Uh, depends on what I happen to be typing at the time when I was putting that slide together. Uh, these tree boards and commissions are usually enabled through uh, at a state level through uh, state enabling legislation and state municipal codes. So the state really dictates that, you know, what authorities uh, counties or local municipalities have uh, in establishing uh, various codes and ordinances and what authorities they have in terms of what they're allowed to do uh, from anything from land use planning uh, to uh, anything and everything else at a local level. In Pennsylvania, uh, we as a one of four commonwealths in, in uh, the United States uh, and very much embrace that concept of commonwealth in that we have a lot of local government, uh, approximately 2,700 local municipalities um, across, uh, uh, across the state and each is given the authority by the state to carry out uh, their own land use planning, zoning, uh, ordinances, and wrapped in with that is the uh, ability to have shade tree commissions. Pennsylvania authorized this in 1909, so uh, just over you know, 100 and uh, a few years ago uh, that this has been in place in Pennsylvania for those municipalities to have this uh, ability to really uh, manage their local municipal trees. So what does the Shade Tree Commission do or the Tree Board do? They do quite a few things and it can again vary from place to place. It depends on what is right for that community uh, and the extent of the uh, resources available. But typically uh, a commission or tree board will develop and act and enforce uh, street tree ordinances They'll develop recommended tree planting lists, uh, bore cultural and other standards. And then they'll develop and implement the community forestry program as a whole. So they would oversee having an inventory conducted um, and then developing a community tree plan from that. Uh, that community tree plan where they can establish objectives for what they want the commission to accomplish, what they want the community forest uh, to look like. And then on a more annual basis or day-to-day uh, -day basis, working on work plans and budgets uh, to strategize for that year. What can we, what is our budget? What are we able to spend? What are we able to accomplish uh, out of those objectives in, in the tree plan? Other things that they do, they review and adjudicate planting, removal, and maintenance permits. Uh, so they're the uh, in a sense administrating uh, the these decisions about uh, whether trees will be planted, trees will be removed, and depending on if the municipality or community uses permits uh, for various maintenance or removals uh, will be involved in that process as well. They assist in volunteer education and special programs. So the not only are they acting to carry out this community forestry program, they really need to be the ones that are recruiting and uh, setting up and, and uh, maintaining and, and making volunteer programs go on, educating the public about trees and keeping people informed. They may be active enforcement of ordinances. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, some of the uh, co components of an ordinance. Uh, there may be uh, components that uh, provide penalties for um, failure to comply with that ordinance. So illegally removing trees or damaging trees and the 
commission may be involved in, in responding to that and enforcing that. And then they're also out there as fundraisers, seeking adequate program funding. This may be going to the municipal government, the municipal council, uh, whatever form of government it may be to request funding from the municipality. They may be seeking out grant uh, funding as well. So tree boards and commissions, they provide policy and leadership um, for the most part. Their primary goal is to really be the, uh, the leaders of the community forest. Uh, and in doing so, they hopefully won't have to do it all on their own and will be able to work with their municipality, have resources available to them uh, to, uh, to make this uh, happen. Beyond that policy and leadership uh, component, uh, there may be administrative and physical work that uh, would be delegated to actual staff of the municipality. Uh, hopefully there would be public work staff, a forestry department possibly, uh, a municipal arborist, the parks department may be involved in maintaining trees within the parks. Sometimes though, especially in our smaller communities, we might not have uh, these resources available to us. We may not have the uh, funding to provide this. And so often the municipal uh, shade tree commission takes on a lot of hats and wears a lot of hats. So they may be out there on the ground, uh, checking out trees to the best of their ability, uh, seeing uh, where things need to be done, helping with planting trees during volunteer events and coordinating those uh, tree planting events. Uh, so depending on the size of the municipality and the resources available, this can, can vary. Uh, when a municipality has the ability to have staff, uh, that can be quite a help. And so especially to have somebody like a municipal arborist on staff that can work uh, specifically with the trees on a regular basis, uh, to be keeping an eye on them, maintaining them, uh, being the expert that actually knows those trees really well and can take care of them and allow the Shade Tree Commission or Tree Board to really be the ones that are uh, working on those higher level questions and dealing with the policy uh, and leadership. So some ideas about some of the things that a Shade Tree Commission might be involved with. Uh, thinking about and working with how to manage pest and disease issues. Uh, many of us are probably familiar with the emerald ash borer <clears throat> here in Pennsylvania, specifically Western Pennsylvania. It is essentially come and gone and we've lost most of our ash trees. For many of you uh, in other locations, this, uh, this particular pest is only recently arrived or has yet to arrive. And so it's something where you might be thinking, how do we plan for this, the inevitable arrival of this uh, insect and how do we manage it? One thing we're dealing with here in Eastern Pennsylvania is uh, the arrival of another invasive insect, spotted lanternfly uh, that has, uh, you can see in this map here, that little red spot, that red area in the map where where this has been uh, identified uh, as of last fall. And so trying to deal with uh, the impacts of these invasive insects or pests and disease, uh, something we certainly uh, want to work on. How to deal with utilities. So uh, we're talking about public trees primarily. Uh, often these are big trees that are in the public right of way between the sidewalk and the roadway or next to the roadway uh, where we also have utility lines. And so we see things like this where the utility companies are required under federal regulations to maintain certain uh, clearances around utility lines. Uh, how do we accommodate that with, with trees that may be already planted there? Here, the right, this is perhaps or definitely not the right tree for this location but this was pruned to accommodate those utility lines and it'll require a little bit more maintenance going forward. 
Uh, so making good decisions about choosing the right tree for the right place. Managing tree risk and liability. Uh, so in any situation in, in a community where we've got people uh, in proximity to trees as well as buildings and cars and sidewalks, roadways and, and whatnot uh, as well in proximity to these trees. We have to be concerned about risk. Conducting tree inventories uh, to inspect the trees and make sure that they're in okay shape or identify trees that may have some uh, defects or potential risk uh, is important. And this falls back to the the uh, tree board to uh, manage this and and take care of make sure that they're finding funding and making an inventory happen. This way we can kind of proactively manage some of these issues, take care of them ahead of time and uh, avoid liability down the road if those trees do fail. Much cheaper to do an inventory take care of getting rid of trees ahead of time before letting them fall and ending up with a lawsuit. Uh, they may do uh, species selection and planting standards. Uh, so there may be tree species lists in terms of uh, perhaps approved species. Uh, I prefer to see kind of lists that may include species that are um, prohibited. So things that are invasive, or uh, simply are not appropriate for uh, our kind of uh, you know, communities where we have dense urban areas or, or even just places where we have people and trees proximate to each other. Trees that are weak wooded and tend to fall apart. Um, and then planting standards along with that to ensure that trees that are planted are done so properly so that they have the best chance of uh, surviving. Following from that, standards for uh, care and arboricultural work. Um, this is important too. So once those trees are already there and established, ensuring that they're maintained properly. Uh, there are many ways to accomplish this. I do have up here in the, the uh, top a uh, reference to the Borough State College in Pennsylvania, their Public Works Department Rules and Regulations for Arbor Work. And this is a special document that is uh, referenced in the, the tree ordinance and uh, specifies, but it sits outside of the ordinance, but specifies details about how tree care should occur on the public trees. Um, and references back to things like the ISA best management practices and ANSI standards. What we want to avoid is having someone like this in this cartoon come in, provide us with uh, less than ideal uh, tree work. Things like young tree maintenance would be important and things that a commission or tree board would be able to accomplish with volunteers uh, that are, have been trained. Uh, so this is work that can be done from the ground, so it's relatively safe. And doing this work early on can help save costs. Dealing with the dreaded sidewalk issues. So we always want to have these trees planted in our communities because of all those benefits they provide. Well, there's some costs here that we see associated with, you know, picking again, the wrong tree for the wrong place, perhaps. Um, there's only about a foot or two of width between that sidewalk and the road, yet these uh, oak trees have been planted here and have survived for quite a long time and gotten to quite a large size, but that has wreaked havoc on these sidewalks. You can see the mess they've made. Uh, in this instance, the driveway to this house um, in the photo on the right uh, is not usable because that sidewalk has lifted up a good uh, almost uh, probably 8 to 12 inches high, just high enough that you cannot get the car up and over into that driveway. So this is an extreme example, but things that a tree commission needs to deal with. Um, citizens are going to come back and complain about the trees to that tree commission and they're going to have to explain 
uh, what the solution is going to be, how to avoid it in the future, and um, defend having trees there. You know, so solutions like potentially using root barriers uh, going forward in the future. And as I mentioned before, developing a community tree plan, uh, probably one of the big important things for the uh, municipality, the, the tree commission to do. And you can see here various parts that we want to include in this community tree plan. So talking to getting into ordinances now, and there is, uh, you know, various things I've mentioned about ordinances so far, and I was kind of putting this together, thinking about this as like a chicken and egg type scenario. You need a tree commission to deal with getting ordinances put together and in place, but you need an ordinance to establish a tree commission in the first place. So. Uh, you kind of need both to happen simultaneously in this case to get them started. So uh, ordinances, uh, before you get into some of the details, over just in general uh, speaking, um, they're established under the idea of police power. Uh, so what this means is there's an authority to protect the safety, health, and welfare of all people. Uh, so this establishes, comes down from, uh, from uh, what's established in federal law, then into state laws, and, and then down to the local level. State codes and legislation establish the powers of the municipal government. So mention those state enabling legislations, uh, legislation before that allows um, uh, and tells municipalities what they're able to do uh, within uh, you know the, the realm of state law. And then ordinances provide legal standing. So the important reason for having and establishing shade tree ordinances is that it provides important protection in terms of making it official, a legal standing document that um, uh, protects those trees or establishes a shade tree commission and it's in the code of the municipality as a result, that becomes more difficult to change than just simply, say, uh, having a municipality issue a resolution about something. Uh, this is good and bad. The good thing is it keeps these protections in place. At the same time, if we find something bad in our ordinance that we want to change, it creates a lot more work to update it and get it uh, corrected. Before I get into talking about specifically tree ordinances, I want to mention some other related types of ordinances uh, to give some idea of the, the range of places where we can actually look at uh, incorporating uh, urban and community forestry. Our zoning regulations regulate density uh, and the type of land use include, and they can include tree and natural resource protection. Uh, following from that a little bit related subdivision and land development ordinances. Uh, these are procedural and design standards for development. And so the result is they can specify requirements for trees and other landscaping. So a certain number of trees uh, required per certain number of parking spaces or per certain acreage of land. Tree preservation ordinances are uh, ordinances specifically uh, specifying details on preserving, protecting trees uh, and the environment in which they need to grow. So the soil volume, the space above the ground as well uh, to protect them from development. Riparian uh, floodplain, steep slope, wetland ordinances and other ordinances that protect uh, sensitive environmental areas. Uh, will protect the vegetation, including trees in those areas. Uh, it's, it's a great place to um, not only maintain trees, but protect environmental benefits provided and needed uh, in terms of some of these areas to prevent especially uh, flooding, landslides, and other, um, other issues. And stormwater regulations, regulating the amount of impervious surfaces, uh, how much uh, peak flow is allowed, uh, requiring management of stormwater on site and landscaping as green infrastructure to help manage that. 
And in Pennsylvania, we also have timber harvest ordinances that can regulate timber harvest activities. Uh, timber harvesting cannot be prohibited in Pennsylvania, but um, it can be, there can be local ordinances established that require permits and um, help prevent kind of clear cutting incidences, uh, but, and do it in a, hopefully in a more sustainable manner. So the uh, one I want to focus on for sure, though, is uh, street or shade tree ordinances that specifically are around protecting the trees, enhancing uh, the public trees in a municipality or community. Um, these would be trees that are along streets in the public right of ways, in parks, um, and other municipal owned spaces. The ordinances can also uh, include information on managing hazardous or nuisance trees uh, that may not be on public property. So uh, trees that are diseased or like at risk of falling over, uh, you know, clearly visibly in a state of uh, uh, poor condition and potentially could fall and damage, uh, especially areas in the public right of way, these can be declared a nuisance uh, by the municipality and require removal of that tree. It can manage disease and insect problems, uh, as we talked a little bit about earlier. And primarily these apply only to public property. It's very difficult to include um, ordinances that regulate or limit what can and can't be done on private property around uh, tree planting. There's not too many examples of that. Uh, for the, so for the most part, they are limited to public uh, property. And then finally, they establish and provide authority for the Shakespeare Commission that uh, we discussed earlier. So uh, coming off of that, it, these ordinances will officially establish and empower that Shree Board or Commission, outlining the responsibilities and authorities of the board. Uh, so it will talk about the number of commission members uh, how many people are on that board uh, at any, and, and what's required as a minimum. Uh, are there any makeup requirements for that? Uh, in certain places where you have a big enough population, you may specify that certain positions have to be occupied by a landscape architect or a forester or an arborist uh, uh, or an educator. Usually we're just looking for citizens at large within that community. Uh, sometimes if, uh, uh, we want to make sure we're getting good representation of all areas of a community. We may specify uh, neighborhoods or areas of, of the municipality that people are from. So place of residence, generally uh, the member would have to be a member of the community. It's not always the case, but uh, we want people who live in that community to be on that uh, uh, board. Compensation. Technically, a shakespeare commissioner, at least in Pennsylvania, could be compensated uh, by the municipality. Rarely, if ever, happens, but uh, it's something that could be done. Uh, also specified would be lengths of term, number of terms. So, how long is a term? How long can? How many terms can a person have? Uh, it may specify rotations into uh, leadership positions on the committee. And then vacancies uh, on the commission, how to deal with those, as well as appointments. If, if people are appointed, what the process is, does it go to a mayor or a municipal council to approve appointments to the uh, commission? We talked about some of the things that the Shea uh commission would do, uh, but just kind of going through this again, what would we actually specify in the ordinance? Things like advise the director and arborist forester of the municipality on planting maintenance and removal of trees, recommending tree species for public areas, uh, recommending controlling disease and pests, tree planting and maintenance standards, public education participation. Um, but this ordinance officially establishes and empowers the tree board or commission and outlines their responsibilities and authorities. Uh, so it, it, it indicates what they're allowed to do or not do. Some other things, recommendations on rules, regulations, and ordinances. 
um, does the commission have the ability to conduct public hearings, uh, review and approve permit applications? Uh, can it recommend on enforcement issues? Uh, in some cases, they may review development permits that impact public trees. So subdivision and land development ordinances, um, if there is new uh, development occurring, the Shazer Commission may be part of the process in reviewing the plans uh, to make sure that it, the plans are in compliance with the uh, uh, tree ordinance. And again, we mentioned soliciting and accepting grants and contributions, so fundraising, uh, and uh, the ordinance would specify what they are or not allowed to do in terms of fundraising. An important part of the ordinance is it will specify whether or not that commission is advisory or decision making. Um, the municipal council or mayor, however the local government is set up, can put into the ordinance that, uh, for a street commission that it's either advisory or decision making. If it's advisory, the body uh, that, that shakes your commission is simply providing advice on those tree matters and their decisions are presented to the municipal council or uh, other local governing officials to be decided on by them. So it's recommendations to the municipal council. In a decision-making body, the commission is actually granted all responsibility um, uh, and, and it's given to the commission. So council uh, um, gives them the authority to make decisions. Uh, so when the commission makes a decision, it does not have to be further reviewed by the council. If a council disagrees with the commission, the only alternative for that for them is to disband the commission. Uh, which would be a very extreme uh, action for them to take. So this is uh, something that we typically don't see a tree commission as a decision-making body. Typically there would be advisory um, where the commission or tree board is able to make recommendations. Uh, they will decide what, you know, what we, we think should be done. Trees should be planted here. These trees should be removed. And they would go to the municipal council who would then approve that or deny it or make changes to it. So uh, beyond the uh, specifying the details about the tree commission or tree board itself, the ordinances would also outline uh, details about uh, protecting and enhancing the, the community forest. Uh, some of the pieces of the security ordinance then would include its location in the municipal code, what the purpose of the ordinance is for, and then definitions of terms that may be used in that code. Very standard uh, procedure in terms of, of the start of any uh, ordinance in a, a local uh, code. We, we uh, mentioned the establishment and authority of the tree commission and then it would go on to talk about things like completion and review of a community tree plan, the duties and authority of any staff. So if there is an urban forester or a municipal arborist um, or somebody at Public Works or the Parks Department that would have duties related to uh, street trees that would be established in this ordinance. The ordinance would also provide for permitting processes. So if permits are required for the removal or pruning of trees, um, how that permit process is administrated it would then also provide for arboricultural practices. I mentioned in State College Borough earlier, um, having a separate document, an appendix of uh, proper arboricultural practices. Uh, so that can be updated as uh, changes occur in best practices without having to go through the whole ordinance process, uh, simply referencing that document in the ordinance itself. Uh, we mentioned public safety and nuisance issues uh, earlier. So if a tree is on pi private or public property and poses some kind of a nuisance, uh, the 
municipality would have the power to declare it a nuisance and require action be taken. Protection of trees, uh, this may lie in a street tree ordinance. There may be separate tree protection ordinance as well. Uh, interference, so if there is anything that happens with that tree, damage or um, uh, death of that tree and the process for responding to that. Um, uh, the appeal procedure, if there are, whether it's a permit process or other uh, violations of the code, how does one uh, respond to that? Do they have to go before the commission? Do they go before the municipal council? And then enforcement and restitution. Are there any fines or penalties for damaging uh, trees and um, how do they get administered? How, uh, how are they applied? And uh, is there any process specific to how the value of the tree is determined? And if that's part of the uh, restitution. I will mention at the end uh, a great publication that's a great resource uh, that has a lot more detail on how you can think about these ordinances and change your commissions and structuring them. Uh, within our limited time here, I don't want to bog down on those details, but I'll give you a reference to that at the end. Volunteers, uh, public participation and education. So we can set up a Shakespeare Commission, we can set up tree ordinances, but they're not going to do us any good if we do not have the public on board with, uh, with our program, with our community tree program. Uh, so we need to make sure that we're educating the public on the trees. We need to make sure that public is, has an opportunity to participate in the process. And that may be through volunteering with tree plantings or other projects. Uh, but I want to talk about that role of volunteers in the process and the public in the process as well. So when we talk about this as volunteers, uh, I want to start with this volunteer management cycle. People are a really great resource in making our community forest better and uh, uh, in keeping it maintained. Uh, so if we're using volunteers, we want to do it such that we're maintaining those volunteers and uh, making sure they come back and have a good experience. So this volunteer management cycle helps us think about this. We start with the planning stage, make sure that we're planning volunteer events properly. Then we recruit and we're making good efforts in terms of recruiting volunteers, providing them some training as needed, um, supervising them and giving them assistance at the volunteer event, and then most importantly, recognizing them for the work that they've provided. And this comes back around, we can take all of that as a feedback loop into planning the next event to make it even better. We can think of volunteers, we want to think about where, where can we look for volunteers. Uh, there's any number of places we can go to for volunteers. So just our friends uh, and family. And going to just the places that we work with in, uh, our, in our social circles on a regular basis. So schools, community service clubs at schools, alumni association, businesses, many corporations are always looking for volunteer opportunities uh, that they do days of service. The United Way is an umbrella for a lot of volunteer um, and nonprofit organizations. Uh, scout troops, uh, some of this may be uh, pertinent to some of their uh, merit badges that they're er earning um, related to whether it's forestry or other topics. Advertising in newspapers, churches, in the bulletins, community events and festivals, doing tabling events, and then signs and banners during work days to let other people know what's going on so they can participate in the future. And even the judicial system, there may be folks that need volunteer community service hours as part of their, um, uh, that are coming through that system. Uh, and so they, you may be able to work with the judicial system to uh, have some of those folks work with your volunteer events. 
we want to retain volunteers though as soon as we recruit them and so that starts at, at the event itself um, we want to be on time and start promptly we want to be prepared and have meaningful tasks and all the supplies we're going to need so we as coordinators of those volunteer events want to be prepared we want to provide orientation to our volunteers, let them know why we're doing this, what they're doing, provide training on those small details. So demonstrating how to plant a tree properly. And then having uh, maybe it's some of your volunteers, maybe some of the coordinators involved that help with throughout the event with some of those details and making sure folks are um, understood the training and, and are are able to perform the tasks they're being asked to. And always be enthusiastic. We wanna greet and welcome people. We wanna make them happy, make them feel welcome. Have a sign in sheet. We wanna be able to follow up and contact them afterwards and keep track of how many volunteers we had. And we also wanna be realistic about what can be accomplished in the time frame we have. Food is very important. It always seems to keep volunteers happy. Um, we may reward them with t-shirts. Maybe there might be some gift certificates given away. Um, hand tools when we're talking about trees. Uh, Tree Pittsburgh here in Pittsburgh, a nonprofit, uh, they have a nice program with their volunteers that after a certain number of volunteer events, they have a punch card that gets punched each time and they get a new hand tool after volunteering five or 10 times so they can get a hand pruner or a hand saw. Uh, not only are they getting a nice free tool in recognition of their work, it encourages them to come back and you've given them tools that they can help, help with uh, your volunteer projects with. Getting food from local vendors, local businesses, uh, as well as maybe gift certificates um, that they may be willing to donate those supplies. And then always follow up uh, with a phone call, letter, and email. Never stop saying thank you to your volunteers. So I wanna come back around to everything we've talked about so far and what the role for Extension is in promoting urban and community forestry. Essentially, it's all about having uh, somebody that can provide a lot of information and act as a facilitator. So I like to think of it as education and, and facilitator. One thing that we primarily talk about in Extinction is being uh, as an avenue, a conduit for providing the newest and best uh, science-based practices uh, in particular topics out to the community, out to citizens, out to um, professionals as well. And so uh, we have a role in terms of providing education. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, and uh, Vinny talked about this in his uh, presentation a few weeks ago, we have a tree tenders program um, that really aims to educate citizens on the basics of, of tree planting, aftercare, and, and so on and so forth. So educational opportunities like that to get people interested and informed. I also see the role of extension as a facilitator working with communities. So often the, there is desire to protect trees and enhance the community forest the community. They just don't know where to start. And so it's often working with and encouraging communities. Um, uh, a lot of what the, uh, the work that I do and is involved in um, helping communities understand ordinances and the details of those ordinances, what they need to put in there, what's going to work for their community, and what might be too much for their community given the available resources. And we're, so we're connecting them as well, not just with our own knowledge and resources, but to others that uh, uh, may have resources as well. So information and resources, possible uh, uh, grant monies available, uh, and so on and so forth. So in a sense, uh, some handholding with communities to keep uh, some of these things going. Have worked with communities that have started shake commissions and have gotten ordinances on the books. And over the course of a number of years, continuing to work with them to get them up to speed and 
uh, successful with their community tree program. So I mentioned uh, in terms of resources, this is a, an 88 page publication that we have from Penn State Extension um, called Managing Natural Resources, a guide for municipal commissions. So this whole document is formed around uh, communities and a municipal level of, of, of thinking about natural resources, but primarily focused on our trees, uh, public trees and street trees. And so covers a lot of information on establishing tree commissions and boards uh, establishing ordinances and then managing a lot of that going forward. Uh, so it's a great resource. The website is here. I don't believe you're able to click on this, unfortunately. What also works is simply typing this title, Managing Natural Resources, a Guide for Municipal Commissions into Google, and it should come up uh, first or second on that list. So I certainly want to thank you today for listening and uh, uh, to this presentation and uh, want to turn this over back over to Holly to um, uh, moderate the questions if there are any. Great. Thank you, Brian. That was excellent. Okay, let me uh, take the reins here again. Hold on one second. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Uh, Brian, maybe you can chime in there. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. That's okay. That's okay. I got a little yes on the chat box. Okay. <laughs> Thanks again so much. That was an excellent overview. Um, so everyone, we want to take some questions um, for those who want to, to hang on. But uh, um, while you guys are typing, please type in the Q&A box. You should see an icon on your screen for that, uh, not the chat box, um, just so I can keep track of everything. But as you're typing questions in the q and I'm going to go over this last slide. And um, it provides some information that some of you may need. Um, but again, uh, we have our, our speaker here and uh, Brian has, has so wonderfully offered to take any questions if you have any. Um, if you have any questions about the series on a whole that I talked about earlier in the webinar, um, please direct those towards me. So our webinar today is going to be archived in the next few days or what's called quote unquote on demand at forestrywebinars.net. That's where you accessed information about this webinar today. So um, it will be archived if you want to watch it again or if you want to refer it to someone else. Uh, we definitely recommend that. So as mentioned, this webinar today is part of a series and there's 12 webinars in the series. Today was number six. Um, so we have the previous webinars archived. Um, our next webinar is going to be on June June 26th at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and it is called Have You Checked Your Trees Lately? A Routine Checkup of Trees Saves Lives and Property, and that's being presented by Dr. Robert Polomsky of Clemson University Extension. So um, please join us for that. Again, you can find information on that webinar at forestrywebinars.net. Webinar, Okay, so if you need any information about ISA or SAF credits, um, you want to return to your open browser window um, to continue the process that's offered in step two at forestrywebinars.net. And we also have a satisfaction survey attached to that if you'd like to provide us some information um, for improving these webinars. Okay, let's get to the questions. All right. Okay. Um, Brian, do you have examples of model shade tree ordinances for municipalities? Yes, I do. At least uh, for Pennsylvania, um, again, they may vary. There may be some differences in terms of applying it to other states, uh, but certainly uh, I do have some and uh, could uh, would be happy to provide those. Uh, if you um, if you want to email me or if Holly can get us connected, uh, certainly can get those shared to you. Yeah, and again, um, Brian's email is on this last slide that you go you guys can see, so you can shoot him an email or me either way. Okay. Um, so how much interaction between nonprofit NGOs and the and the commissions or tree boards do you see? What ways do you think 
it'd be best for for them to interact uh it depends so uh it it really ends up being about capacity for the municipality and capacity for the the nonprofit um certainly uh so i'll use pittsburgh as an example we have an organization called tree pittsburgh here uh that is you know, has been well established and is a strong program so it is able to provide a uh, uh, a lot of assistance in terms of long-term projects. Uh, in other cases, the capacity of a nonprofit may be such that, and the municipality, uh, especially if the municipality is starting off, that it may be better to start with more short-term projects, see how it works out, and then uh, evaluate and consider if, if uh, longer-term uh, projects would be more appropriate. Great. Okay. Um, how do you address the liability issue with unmaintained public trees and communities with little funding for tree care? Uh, that's a great question because um, there isn't a, always a great answer for that. Uh, so the best answer I could give is that the for the municipality to do what it's able to do, um, that may be uh, conducting uh, <laughs> Uh, some kind of very basic inventory or simply notating when something is observed as uh, potentially being uh, in, in poor shape and maybe being a liability to, to notate that. Um, the, there, you can't avoid necessarily that liability from becoming a problem, but if if the municipality is keeping records and at least understanding that there is a liability there, uh, that's better than if they're trying to ignore it. Um, ignoring the liabilities is never an acceptable answer. So uh, it's doing whatever is possible to do, um, though understanding that with limited resources that can be difficult. All right, so have you ever seen a commission that has been able to levy a small ad valorem tax to fund their activities? I don't know of any offhand. Um, I, I think it could be, it, it could be, it would certainly be legal, it could be figured out that, that that could be established. I can't think of any examples where that has been done. But I know when surveying residents and communities that studies have found that people are willing to pay a little bit for having those services. Um, more likely than not, uh, it's something that maybe is more typically uh, by some of those communities, they're able to better plan in terms of budget and roll that into overall budget needs and uh, provide some, you know, you know, basically increase overall tax rates if that's if that was the case that additional funding was needed. But uh, typically, uh, that that doesn't happen. I think it's difficult to get done, but uh, could be done. Okay, we just have two more. Um, any thoughts about several municipalities combining to do community forestry, or maybe hiring a consultant to help with community forestry? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we have uh, worked with communities here in the Pittsburgh area um, where we've done some uh, multi-municipal shade tree commissions. So we've actually been able to organize within those, those municipalities involved uh, agreements that they would have a, a joint kind of a multi-municipal uh, shade tree commission that uh, would carry out the duties of uh, Shakespeare Commission across the three municipalities. Um, funding can get tricky around that. And so we were successful essentially around the idea of keeping the money out. And so um, turning into kind of money becomes a request on an as needed basis within each municipality. But it, it can be done. Uh, it could possibly also be done in a less formal way where um, uh, is, if it's using consultants or other uh, contracted services, that that can be uh, 
certainly done with the multi-municipal agreement where those services are shared amongst uh, multiple municipalities. Okay, we have uh, two more questions. Do you wanna spend uh, just a few more minutes answering yeah, sure. them? Okay. Sure. Yep. Um, so I, again, I'm just gonna take these last two questions. Uh, so any, any comments on how to maximize the role of heritage tree programs in enhancing the urban forest? Uh, another great question, and that's something we've talked about just in the city of Pittsburgh with uh, having having this as a, a, a something to recognize those trees, typically trees that are larger and providing more benefits or have some significance. And so potentially um, rolling that in at a municipal level into um, a community forestry program uh, would be great, especially around the educational opportunities they can provide uh, in recognizing those trees. Uh, so that, that's certainly uh, a great idea. Um, how to best incorporate it, um, I, you know, there's a number of ways that could be done, um, but it's certainly something that can be done. Okay, and uh, last question. Where have you had the most success when beginning an ordinance? Mayor, council, city staff, or city champion? Uh, hmm. That's a good question in, uh, in terms of trying to think about my experiences with that. I think what works successfully is uh, in terms of uh, having champions that are also the ones that can be the founding members on that Shade Tree Commission. At the same time, there needs to be, typically we'll need an advocate on the council. So you need somebody on that council that will serve as an advocate to convince the other council members that this is a good thing to do. Um, that mayor, a mayor may also serve as that advocate. And again, depending on the way that the local government specifically structured can affect how that might work. Uh, but a mayor or council person as an advocate in addition to uh, a few dedicated citizens who want to make that happen. Great. Um, I wanted to draw attention, uh, Carrie Tauscher um, in the chat box provided a number of web links to ordinance resources online. So if for those left on the call, if you want to access those, she has several different links here. Um, so just look at your chat box towards the end of the, um, the end of the, the row there of comments. But okay, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Walimiak. I really appreciate it and I probably butchered your name again and I apologize. Um, but we really appreciate you taking the time to put this outstanding webinar together. Was there anything else you wanted to, to share with the participants? I just want to say uh, thanks to Carrie for sharing those uh, links as well. Those are, um, those are some good links uh, in terms of a variety of resources that have some good information. Okay, well, great, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar today, and I hope everyone has a great day. And actually, uh, quickly mention, I'll, I can, uh, we can copy them and paste them back in. They only uh, were sent to you and me, I believe, Holly. Oh, <laughs> okay. So we'll copy those and paste those back in here. Yeah, I can, uh, I can do that right now. Let's see, I can. Let me do that. Thanks for noticing. I didn't even notice that. Uh, okay, can everyone see that now? I think I have all of them. Yep, Did I not I copy and paste them all? Okay, I tried to. I'm sorry if I missed something. <laughs> oh wait, here we go. I didn't get all of them. One more time. Okay, here's the last ones if anyone wants to look those up. Great. Okay, anything else? Oh, that's all. Thank you for, uh, <laughs> for listening in today. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.